This Pretty conference will now be recorded. So, call a meeting to order. Uh, I think most of the people already know each other, so I don't know if we need to go through introductions, Ron, unless there's some specific reason why you see that as necessary. Okay. Uh, we have a copy of the meeting summary as part of the agenda from the, the meeting summary from our October 21st meeting. So I assume you've all gone through that carefully. And if we have any suggestions or need for any changes in it, uh, please offer those changes now. Hearing none. Um, Let's go on. We have a, a guest with us today, Brian Metzger from uh, CDOT, who is going to tell us about adventures with uh, the use and implementation of CDOT's dashboard. So with that, Ron, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, Brian, I'll turn it over to you. Right. There we go. Oh, good. Got it? Can you see it? All right, cool. Um, so my name is Brian Metzger of CDOT. Uh, we were formerly PMO. Now I think we just changed names to Fund Management Reporting and Transparency or something like that. Uh, but anyways, uh, I, I do a lot of the uh, reporting uh, dashboards that we do here at CDOT. Um, was just going to, Rebecca asked me to come and talk through um, some of the external facing dashboards that we actually have out there now that really identifies a lot of our uh, SB dollars and our SB projects that we have, the $3 billion, whatever we're supposed to spend over the next four years of funding. Um, but really just kind of want to talk to them high level, um, spotlight them a little bit, kind of show you what they can do, that kind of good stuff. Uh, so, really, so the first page I'm on is actually, I think, DTV, uh, Rebecca, you guys, this is your guys' website. Um, and you see they're just buttons. Um, the really cool thing about the Power BI dashboarding thing is it's Microsoft. So, you can take embedded code and you can put it in websites, you can put it in, in reports, you can do all kinds of really neat stuff with it. Um, I think you can actually take some of the visualizations and pin them on websites and do some really neat um, things with them. So uh, really, so when you first come to this page here, uh, there's three different uh, reports that we actually have out there to the public. Um, I'll just click on the first one here. So when you click on the thing, it runs the report and it pops up. Uh, so First thing it shows again, to kind of really the only thing that we really want to show with these things is high level information. Uh, one of the biggest conversations that we had is what people are going to see externally. Uh, we don't want the, the I'm sorry, what we show internally, we don't want people to see externally necessarily. Uh, there's a lot more detailed information, so um, there's definitely ways to drill down through this if you kind of know how to get into some different information. So we definitely want to keep this really high level, uh, but really. The only thing that we really do with or we're doing with these um, milestones, um, funding, uh, kind of, you know, where, where, what phase they're in, the map data, again, kind of got all that information from the different stakeholders and different people within uh, the regions and said, hey, what do you guys want to show? What do you want to have? Uh, the real neat thing with, with these versus something like an Excel report or anything like that is the in interactivity around them. Um, it sounded like most of you were watching uh, different uh, election stuff last night um, and you see them always touching the screen and, and popping things out and things like that. Power BI does the exact same thing because um, not always do you want to see, does everybody want to see the same thing? Some people want to see, you know, more detailed information. Uh, so something with Power BI, you can filter, right? Filter um, to this, to Intermountain, whatever it is, and you can start seeing kind of how these projects um, drill down and see what kind of information is there. Well, it's map data, um, funding level data, um, whatever it is. You can actually go into the um, reports as well and click, you know, on the different visuals and say, all right, you know, I want to see what's my Senate bill funding that are in construction. But all right. So now I can really start drilling down and seeing some different data, um, some different information. Again, kind of keeping a real high level um, from there. Uh, something we did with these, uh, we wanted to actually be able to pull a list of information out of here. So we have some drill through functionality. So you can click on some of these milestones and different things and it'll pull you to actual, I mean, it gives you the project names, the dollars, different things like that, what the expenditures were, um, who spent it what, when and where kind of information. Um, that's not always the case with, with some of these, but again, 
um, it is what it is. Um, there is some really cool functionality with Power BI, even since we started building these ones or when we started building these, I think back in like January, I think is when we started um, to now. The uh, ability to drill through to different reports and to different information has come a long way, so it's even easier to do that now. Um, but again, just keeping this stuff really high level, um, not, and it's really it can be really whatever you want. So we can have we can have KPI boxes. You can have different uh, visuals as far as tables and things like that. Uh, if we go into the next one here, load. So same thing, right? You still have the functionality to kind of click and filter down and do different things like that where, where applicable. Um, but you can do tables, right? You can have different bar charts, pie charts, KPIs. Um, I mean, this is this is pivot tables on steroids, really. When you when you look at this stuff, and that's how was, Power BI was explained to me when I first started playing around with this. Um, some different things we're we're playing with um, is like help buttons. So if you click on the help button, this actually brings you to a document and lets you know exactly what everything means, what kind of information it's going to give, how to do different stuff. Um, oops, in this one here. Um, but anyways, trying to give that that audience, those those external viewers especially, who aren't in this data every day or day in and day out, um, what, what's going on with this information? Where's it coming from? Um, it's it's really it's really pretty helpful. Um, even even internally, I found like a lot of this internal stuff we have even more detail. Like I said before, we get really into the weeds about some of this information, um, and you can really drill down through it all. Um, so those help buttons and different visuals that we're playing with to kind of help identify, hey. This is where this is coming from. This is what this calculation is doing. This is what this means. That that kind of information I think really helps, really helps just the audience um, and, and helps me so I don't get so many emails from different from different folks um, about it all. Um, we do have even internally we even have like a feedback button up here that it actually feeds a, a big feedback log that I have and I try to go through every week and make sure that hey if something's not quite working right or whatever we get in play with it and go from there. Um, and so you go to the last one. I think the last one is really kind of um, what Rebecca and her group wanted to do with this or with all these uh, dashboards is these, let it load here. See, so taking a sweet time today. Um, they wanted to get uh, these fact sheets about uh, the different projects. So if I click on a particular project, you can see kind of, hey, this is how much has been planned. This is what the SB funding is, all of the other funds. And Rebecca, I think you guys actually have PDFs that actually will mimic these to some level. Um, but you can see the route, like we can do maps, we can just connect to GIS data, all kinds of different information that we can really connect to. Um, we can write, uh, you know, what's going on with these things, stuff like that. Um, but really, that's kind of the high level of these things. Um, there's really not too much that I found that I can't do with it. Uh, whether it's the functionality behind the scenes, um, that is one thing, you know, if, if we have easy access to data, it's really not that big a deal. Um, a lot of these things I'm already connecting straight to SAP, which is our accounting system. And, um, you know, it has all of our milestones information, based all of our metadata for all the projects, financials, so on and so forth. And it's a click of a refresh button and we, re and we QC it, we publish it, and it's good to go. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty slick. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, yeah. Just the, the larger context here is that um, CDOT has set one of our wildly important goals for the year to um, to create this dashboard under the a broader objective of increasing the transparency and accountability we have to uh, taxpayers of Colorado. So I, yeah. I know right, you wanted this uh, short and quick. All these links are available, and I um, I'll put them in the the chat box. But the Anyone can spend some time on this, and if you have questions, I'm, I'd be happy to convey them to Brian after taking a look at it. Definitely. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Back here. Can you hear myself? There we go. Thanks, thanks, Brian. That was great. Uh, yeah, I do have a few questions. One is, uh, how much training do you find is normally required? For people that are going to use this uh if you're just looking at it uh i mean you can go in and start doing it today if you really wanted to so start clicking around it's really it's nothing more than any other website to, to click around in um, as far as building them um i've been doing it for about four years now 
and I'm still learning stuff all today. So um, <laughs> it, it, it honestly, once you kind of figure out, it's, it's built, the back end of it is built a lot like Excel. Um, so the functionality is like if you want to do VLOOKUPs and, and different things like that, and if then statements and stuff like that, it, as long as you can do that, you can really build these things out and build the functionality around them as far as the coding and, and things. Um, when I started doing it, you had to actually know how to write SQL code to do a lot of the functionality. Uh, now, now it does it for there's power query availability in there and it'll actually write the code for you and then do all the functionality. So it's made it pretty simple. Like I said, it's come a long way. It's, it's, a, it's a Microsoft project product. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, the biggest thing that we, I know we ran into with getting it to externally was the different firewalls within CDOT. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a different way you have to, there's only one person in CDOT that actually has the ability to get a, um, the, uh, what I want to say, the code to actually embed it into a website externally. Um, so that was a big kind of a, I don't want to say it was a big undertaking, but it was a little bit of a, a hurdle. So I don't know what your guys' system is like or anything like that. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's, what if that one person gets hit by a bus? Not an RTD bus, but you know, some other. <laughs> uh, I think there are uh, other people have uh, the availability. I mean, it's easy enough to, to change people. Um, to be able to do it is just the way I think the what the one control it is, and that's just that's great. Um, great Miller, Rebecca. So he's the only one that I know that has that access. Yeah, well, I, think a, admin, well, I think there's other admins that can do it. So we don't want to get too far in the weeds on this, but uh, does the legislature and the governor's office have access to this? Do they use it? The information. So these these external ones are open to the public. So that's that's yeah. so they they as long as they have the link to them or to that website, um, they can go in and, and look at it. So there's different when you publish it. There's different ways to publish it. You can publish it internally, externally. Um, I think there's another way in there to kind of control who's who's in it in different ways. But but yeah, these are external. Um, obviously, we do have some more way more detailed ones internally that are just locked out internal. But um, we have a big. Um, just a big workspace and a CDOT workspace that we have and everybody has access to it. And now I think we, we have an enterprise license um, within CDOT, so. Uh, does that mean that other parts of government can access that intercept site or do we need to buy our own license? I'd say we need our own license. You'd probably need your own license, yes. What's the cost of that, Brian? Uh, we are in, on an enterprise license now, which means everybody, you don't have to buy individual licenses. Individual licenses are $10 a month, I think, or $9.99 or something like that a month. So it's really pretty minimal. Um, we got to a point where so many people were getting into them, like 200 plus, 250 plus people were getting licenses. It was cheaper for us to buy the enterprise license, which just gives access to everybody. You don't have to go to OIT and get a, get a license. You don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. That was, that was kind of a pain at the beginning of this whole building of these and sharing and then they had to go to OIT to get access and it was just a it's just a mess. I'm not positive we would need that. I mean C dot or RTD is considerably smaller than C dot. Yeah I'm not sure if it, if it's like 10, 15 people that are getting into them and good thing is too guys you can you can PDF these things. You can put yeah. them I mean you, I think there's a there's a way to actually go right into it and, and it'll actually put it into a PowerPoint for you. Um, there's there's some and there's ways to actually pull the data out into Excel. It's just a right click export to Excel and then I'll put it in Excel. So if you need to spin it in a different way, I mean, there's all kinds of different things you can do with it. Yeah, I, I would say that the concept is, is good. Uh, I, I'm a little concerned by the complexity, you know, knowing that if you want your board members to be able to look into this, how much training some of those people are gonna, it's gonna take to really get them up to speed. Yeah, um, I know there's there's different things like I said with the helps and things like that. We're really trying to help help bring that along. That hey, if you have a question, what does this button do, or what does that do, or where does this come from? It kind of gives them that, so you don't have to do the, all the trainings and things like that. But I'd gladly walk anybody through this stuff. It's not a big deal. Great. So, Rob, this is Heather. Can I? Sure, Heather, go ahead. So, I just to let you know we are moving to Power BI. Um, we have a BI team. Um, that's in our IT department. Um, our biggest issue, and I think maybe Brian can address this because I know SAP, I, I helped implement SAP at um, CDOT and um, all of their information is in SAP as Brian mentioned, like all of their milestones, their financials, everything. Um, that is probably the biggest difference we're running into here when we look at going to Power BI and doing these dashboards is we don't have that information 
Um, it is all stored on a spreadsheet or in someone's Microsoft project or something like that. So to access that information and combine it with financial information is extremely time consuming and manual. Um, and that's where we have struggled with creating these dashboards is we don't have an enterprise wide system like CDOT does with SAP where all of their project information is in there. They can combine that with financials and conferences, all of contra you know, all of that information is there. And so I just wanted to say, you know, we've looked at this and we are power uh, we're moving to Power BI and our BI team has been exploring how we could do dashboards. They've created some draft dashboards that if the biggest problem we have is getting the data and getting it put it's into usually that the case for the implementation of a new system like this. It's all it's, yep. it's getting access to so all I, the data. Uh, so is, I just want to point out the person that your key contact uh, within RTD for this. Yes, I can send that to you. Great, that would be really helpful. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and Heather, to your point, yeah, that is, I mean, and that's something that we actually deal with a lot, um, even just the dashboards that I was showing, all the, the planning information, a lot of that is offline spreadsheets, it's in Google Sheets and Excel and, and all kinds of different stuff, um, that, that data process, that's something that we definitely want to look at to say, hey, uh, how can we make this thing quick and easy so we're not having to copy, paste, flip things around, let Power BI kind of do a lot of this for us. So we do have this, we run into the same thing, um, but as long as you have that unique identifier, with, whether it's a, a project identifier or whatever it is, um, you can start tying all those, have those relationships and tie it back. So I run into that a lot. Um, and Power BI, the cool thing with that, you can connect to multiple, I mean, I think there's like 150 different sources you can connect to. Um, actually, I'm playing right now with trying to figure out how to connect it to uh, uh, Google, obviously Microsoft and Google don't play very nice together, um, but everybody's doing it like CDOT is all uh, Google product. So whether it's Gmail, Google Sheets, that things, things like that. So it's really easy for us to help maintain and things like that. So good. Great. I think, I think we're out of time on this particular yep, issue. This is not something we're going to resolve today, obviously, yeah. but we, it's, it's part of our learnings. And I really appreciate you being here with us, Brian, to, to give us an overview of this, yeah. and Rebecca, for you managing upsetting and setting up, not upsetting, setting up all of this. <laughs> well, yeah, no problem. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on uh, with the agenda. Uh, the next item is, is uh, one of mine, I wanted to give you a little quick feedback on uh, uh, the COVID immunization support issue. Uh, and very briefly, uh, I have a meeting set up with RTD, uh, with Mike Meter, and Bill Van Meter, Mike Matter, and Bill Van Meter on uh, November 16th. And uh, I'll, we, we have a, a number of things that we're going to go through then. Before that meeting, though, I plan to meet with uh, probably someone from the governor's office to get an overview of exactly where they are in, in, uh, in their activities. And so I've got a contact in there that I'm pursuing to, to be able to do that and to be able to answer a number of questions that they have and, and uh, also continuing to revise the presentation some as well. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, let's move on to the peer agency comparisons, attachment B in our agenda. Thank you, Rut. Um, so, I'll just quickly introduce this, um, Natalie Shishido, uh, uh, CDOT's um, fellow on assisting with this project, has been really helpful. Um, as I think many of you are aware, there are lots of different ways to sort of try to evaluate RTD um, compared to various um, peer agencies around the country, lots of different ways to do that. Natalie's done some really great research on sort of how to do that. And so I thought it'd be useful if Natalie spoke to this issue to the group this morning. Terrific. Natalie, you're on. Great. Hey, everybody. Um, so if we could scroll down to that first page of the attachment. Yeah, that's great. Um, so in my, in my view of this, we're cutting off a little bit on the edge. Yeah, it's off center. Of oh, the yeah. presentation. Good. A little more, a little more. Is that it? Okay. Go ahead. All right, great. So both Ron and I worked on this a little bit. Um, 
we started to look into the data from the National Transit Database uh, to identify some potential peer agencies. Um, I already found one, at least one error in here, so um, I can get down to that when we go over the peer agencies. But um, I looked at some methodology for identifying peer agencies from the Transit Cooperative Research Program, um, and they have a whole methodology that uses likeness scores and comparing likeness scores of different agencies. Um, and I didn't get into that, but I mostly just borrowed some of their metrics that they were using to compare different agencies. Um, so looking at their methodology, they use three screening passes where you kind of break down descriptive measures. Um, so the first is population and urban area characteristics. So looking at density, geographic area. Um, the second is looking at modes and service area type so whether it's rural suburban and then the third kind of depends on your focus area so if you're focusing on finance you're going to use maybe some different metrics than you would if you're looking at operations um, so thinking about that um, we really want to think about what the key purpose for this comparison is um, what core problems should be addressed and um, what specifically want we want to benchmark so whether that's ridership or financial performance, um, and what do we want to prioritize when we're looking at similar agencies? Um, so I can go through some of these agencies quickly. Um, so King County and Massachusetts Bay Transit Authority, um, they both shared pretty similar geographic urban characteristics with um, RTD. So um, whether that's their geographic area, population density, um, both have a population density that's within 25% of RTD's uh, area. Um, looking at County of Miami-Dade, uh, Transportation Public and Public Works, um, this is where I found um, an error. There should be an asterisk after um, the total operating expense because that is also within 10% of the RTD metric and also they have a similar um, amount of vehicles operated at maximum service. Um, TriMet um, has a similar amount of employees, um, total employees, not necessarily um, wage rate. Um, and they also have a popular, yeah. And then the Dallas Area Rapid Transit System um, shares um, a total operating expense. I think it's a little bit cut off there, but um, they have a similar budget allocation. Um, and then I included the um, MARTA and the LA County MTA as well because they were um, kind of self-grouped with RTD for RTD's uh, multi-agency exchange um, where they kind of compared best practices. Um, so it's kind of just a first pass at this. Um, it's still a working document and there's definitely other characteristics that we could compare. Um, things like percentage of low income population, total vehicle miles operated, percent of service that is purchased, which might be important for um, a finance focus, um, population and employment dispersion. And some of these are slightly more complex um, metrics that might require a little bit more than just looking into the National Transit Database. Um, and I wasn't looking at census data, so um, that could also um, play a part in some of these metrics. Um, so if there are any suggestions or um, thoughts on what other um, prioritized characteristics we should include in peer agency, um, I would be really interested to hear what anybody has. Yeah. I, I do have uh, one comment I wanted to ask about. It, it seems like in many ways, MARTA comes closest to Denver. It, the, the population density is much lower uh, for, for us. But, you know, if you, if you look at some of the other, I use MARTA a lot because I, I, I have some stuff going on at Georgia Tech. And, uh, but if, if you look at the numbers across there, there really are some, pretty close similarities, it would seem. But they're yeah. doing 700 million trips, unlinked trips, and we're doing 100 million. That's a pretty dramatic difference. Right. I wonder why. 
Right, and, and that's have, what they have, a, they have a much smaller district area too, Rhett. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're half density. the size. Half the size, which also is pretty remarkable that they're getting so many rides. And I really focus on ridership because it's such a critical issue for us right now. I, I assume our numbers are last year's numbers. And I think there is um, what I kind of came across in looking at methodologies for this, that there is a difference between descriptive measures and performance measures. So if you're looking at ridership, that might be more of a performance measure. Um, seen um it might not be the same like the same type of comparison with a geographic area or population size right you know what might be useful to, to kind of clear the clear the comparisons if, if we took rtd and then we took three that you consider to be good comparisons because you know la metro that's in such a whole different level from what we're what we're doing here I wonder if we could narrow this down some so that we're not uh, buried too much in data. Dan, what do you think? Uh, what are your observations here? Well, I think this is, I know you yeah. run a much smaller transit agency, but what, yeah. what are the parameters? Um, well, I think the information is provided so far is, you know, it's very interesting and, and uh, you know, you can use it to try to hone in on some, um, some, some peers that are roughly equivalent to RTD uh, based on certain measures. But in the, in the transit world, if we want to measure people's efficiencies, then we, we get into, you know, cost per hour, cost per mile, passengers per hour, passengers per mile by mode. So as you go through this process of kind of identifying peers to compare RTD against, um, there may be, you know, population fits, density fits, maximum vehicle hours fit, but it may not fit for each mode. So there's another level, I think, that you need to look at so that you can get down into those mode level comparisons if you're really trying to figure out whether RTD is performing as efficiently as as other peers out there uh, this information is really helpful kind of at the macro level to kind of hone in on who those peers might be um, in general but i think you have to take it down to the next level and start looking at at the modes uh, in order to get at efficiencies so, so natalie maybe you and rebecca and dan can have a conversation about this and, and see how we might narrow this down. It's just too much information to need to look at, at this comparison. Maybe we could we could decide what other agencies may be uh, good good comparisons. Rebecca, what do you think? Well, I'm, I'm glad Dan spoke up because one of my questions was: Are we are we pursuing these comparisons? to identify peer agencies to look at best practices from them or more to compare the kind of health of RTD. And I, I think Dan's questions get us at more the, the second part of that, in, in which case I totally agree. We probably pick just two of two or three of these and get some of those um, efficiencies per mile of transit type. Um, can, can I ask you three to, to report back at the next meeting? on, on uh, what you learn from that next dive in. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm happy to uh, participate in a little subgroup here. Uh, I don't know if I, I think I might have Rebecca's email address, but I don't know if I have Natalie's. Um, I'll connect us, Dan. And I, you know, I did a little bit of a very um, high level analysis that I shared with you, uh, Rhett you know, a month or so ago, that kind of gets at some of the data that we've used in our peer group analysis uh, previously that can maybe give you some thoughts about how to go, how to approach it. Great, good. All right, uh, we can, let's, uh, let's keep moving. Uh, Fast Tracks Unfinished Corridors Report.
Thank you, Rut. That would be me from Pepsdorf. Uh, let me stop sharing that. I hate it when Alexa tries to interrupt my meetings. So I wanted to, uh, this is the beginning of a conversation, not the end of a conversation. Um, wanted to kind of give some quick background. We provided a link in the agenda packet to an unfinished fast tracks report uh, that RTD staff prepared uh, back last year, June of 2019. So a lot has A lot has happened since then, um, obviously, but still a good a good kind of benchmark. So just by way of reference, this is sort of the map of the RTD um, rail system. Um, you can see the dotted lines are sort of the unfinished lines, if you can see that very well. Uh, Northwest rail um, extending uh, as an extension of the B line, uh, the extension of the N line uh, north of North Glen, the um, Southwest rail extension of the C and D lines down to C470 and Highlands Ranch, um, sort of the, and then there's a central rail extension uh, project um, as well uh, in the, in the kind of mostly central city. So um, just to give you some perspective, since, since Fast Tracks was approved by the voters back in 2004, uh, there's been about 25 miles of light rail constructed by RTD, 53 miles of commuter rail, the Flatiron, Flatiron Flyer bus rapid transit system, uh, as well as the Union Station um, uh, rehabilitation uh, redevelopment project. So a lot has happened, but some significant unfinished sort of corridors from the Fast Tracks plan. Um, so I'm just going to hit I thought I'd hit a couple of highlights from a presentation that RTD staff provided to the board back in July of last year uh, after this report was completed. Um, quick snapshot of the unfinished corridors that I mentioned, the Central Rail, the North Metro completion, the Northwest Rail, uh, and the Southwest Extension project. So those four corridors totaling uh, in 2018 dollars cost estimates of just over $2 billion to complete those uh, to complete those projects. Um, RTD staff did um, identify a couple of different scenarios that they about, that they analyzed um, to look at how to address the, un, the unfinished corridors. Uh, the first scenario was no new bonding authority or new funding for RTD uh, above what their current status is. Uh, a, a, an election to the voters uh, uh, taper for additional bonding authority. Um, and third, a Tabor election with additional bonding authority and coupled with a sales and use tax increase. Uh, so those were the three key scenarios that were evaluated. I'm just going to zip through a couple of these slides, uh, kind of what the results of those scenarios were. So uh, with no new bonding authority or funding, uh, kind of the estimate at that time was that by 2050, um, RTD would have the resources using um, certificates of participation as a funding mechanism to fund replacement of vehicles uh, to uh, finish three of the four corridors, um, the central corridor, the southwest extension, and the north metro line extension, uh, which but would not include um, any, any service, any extension, any peak period service in the northwest rail corridor, or finish the Northwest Rail peak service option instead of the full corridor improvements there uh, in 2042, but no other of those three corridors completed by 2050 horizon year. Scenario two, which was the additional bonding authority via a voter election, um, uh, would still you'd use um, those certificates of participation as a funding mechanism for vehicle replacement uh, you could sequence the unfinished corridors, starting with the least expensive uh, and going to the most expensive. So the central corridor, the southwest corridor extension, north metro extension, and then a peak hour service plan in the northwest rail that would get all that would get completed by 2048. So you can see each of the estimated completion years for each of those corridors. It does not give enough uh, uh, 
uh, funding capacity to finish the full Northwest Rail service plan by 2050. Um, kind of a, a couple of different um, options under that uh, scenario too. You could do the Northwest uh, Rail peak service plan first uh, in 2042, and then the other quarter, the other those other three corridors could be finished by 2050, but later in the plan. Uh, again, does not complete the full service plan in Northwest Rail. The second option there uh, would be to finish the Northwest Rail a full service plan by 2046, and then uh, no ability to complete any of the other unfinished um, corridors. Under the scenario three concept, uh, that's a Tabor election with bonding and increased sales and use taxes. Uh, that would, um, assuming that that went to the, went to the voters and, and was passed in 2021, which I think we can all agree, lots changed since this report was done. That's probably not in the cards, uh, but, all the scenarios um, under that option do complete the unfinished quarters by 2040. And then there's just different different ways to approach the sequencing of those projects um, and different levels of sales and use tax increases. So you could do the Northwest Rail peak service plan uh, first by 2026, and then you do the, you do the other um, central Southwest extension and North Metro extensions over a period of years. Uh, through 2035, and then you implement the full service in Northwest Rail by 2039. Um, again, yeah, assuming I, that point. I, I have to say, you know, I, knowing, knowing the nature of Colorado taxpayers in the situation that we're in here, uh, scenarios two and three just seem really remote. Uh, I, I wish that weren't the case, but it, yeah, they just gave themselves a tax cut, which made no sense, but it's a whole other issue. So this, is, this is not a judgment on the feasibility of this, right? Um, yeah, I, I think that, but just to give people a sense for what it would take at the, you know, as of the middle of last year, what, what it looked like it, it might take to kind of get, get these, uh, get these completed given sort of the current the status of RTD's finances at that time, uh, which obviously have changed pretty significantly. Um, yeah, and Ron, I, I don't, I don't mean yeah. to sound at all like I'm giving you a hard time about this. No, it's no, no. The reality that we're faced with. Yep. It's a pretty, pretty tough reality. The the one thing I would I would want to observe on this is that we're talking about a long time in the future and technology changes sometimes more rapidly than trains do. And it could be that there are some other alternative ways of trying to address some of these things that are going to be worth considering if we're if the alternative is something that's that's decades out. Uh, coming from a VC background uh, in technology, that that seems like a, there may be some possible alternative scenarios. But I don't think anybody's going to be happy with paying taxes, especially the people up in the Northwest, uh, for something that might happen by 2050. Elise? Um, yeah, I agree. Certainly under the current circumstances, I don't think there's enough trust for people to, to vote to tax themselves twice for the same thing, particularly when the thing that they're getting isn't going to be um, arriving anytime soon. So I, the circumstances would have to change dramatically in terms of timing and, and trust. I guess w one thing that isn't envisioned, and I don't know, Ron, if you were completed, <laughs> done with your report before we jumped in with questions, is there's this new um, idea of front range passenger rail that's um, uh, shown up on the horizon. I don't know that it's any more likely, um, but uh, what is different about that is that it would potentially include the same alignment for Northwest Rail, but add other destinations and partners and the, the prospect of potential federal funding and Amtrak's involvement, which is a, a bigger portfolio of players than we currently have. Um, looking, and I guess I'm focused on Northwest Rail in particular in, this, in that scenario. Um, has there been any thinking done by RTD or others on how we should should we be thinking about that potential option with regards to um, 
achieving Northwest Rail and what that might look like. Yeah, Lynn, as you, or, or Ron, I think both of you may be able to yeah. turn into this. Ron, why don't you go ahead first? Sure, I'll, I'll, you know, there, there are some conversations about that. There's a lot of work going on uh, for Front Range Passenger Rail, as, as Commissioner Jones rightfully points out. It's got a long path ahead of it. Um, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know they are at the stage of looking at potential routes, and one of those routes sort of mirrors or follows roughly the Northwest Rail path. And so there may be opportunities if that project sort of gets gets momentum and, and moves forward to sort of provide or supplement or complement um, service that ends up kind of combined giving um, kind of what was intended in the Northwest Rail project in Fast Tracks. Um, you know, he's maybe combined with Flatiron Flyer mm -hmm. and Bus Rapid Transit project, uh, 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 services on the State Highway 119 corridor, that diagonal highway between Longmont and Boulder. I mean, there's different ways coupled with Front Range Passenger Rail if it took that route and if it gets legs um, to kind of provide some sort of equivalent service. So that we're, we're, we're thinking about that, um, folks. We just don't, you know, there's still quite a bit of work to do. I understand. Yeah, I, I read a few articles on that potential alternative but it didn't seem to have it didn't seem to have obvious legs to move forward lynn i wonder if you might offer some comments sure. and um yeah i'll add in i'm sorry i'm having techno technology issues so i'm sort of there but uh um it, i think that that ron's summary was good uh bill van meter sits on the front range rail commission uh we have a um, I'll be in a meeting with some of the planners next week talking about, uh, you know, how Front Range Rail might combine with RTD, um, but it's all very uh, tentative, I think, since Front Range Rail hasn't chosen a, an alignment, um, uh, but I would agree with Elise, you know, certainly, hopefully, looking at um, Front Range Rail, if they're looking at it, we, it, you know, it would be my hope, not speaking for the agency, that it perhaps could help solve our Northwest Rail issues as well. Tough one, really a tough one. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't wait to see the solution to this that we come up with in this committee. <laughs> yeah, right. I, just, uh, I did want to just point out in the report there, are, you know, RTD staff looked at, you know, other revenue options as well to kind of do this. I think uh, there's also the possibility given the state's focus on climate change and greenhouse gas emissions that you know there may be opportunities as part of a larger statewide transportation package some some additional resources to help invest in transit as a piece of addressing the state's climate change goals and reducing greenhouse gas emissions so there's other other conversations also that are picking up steam since this report was done that might provide some opportunities well i hope there's i hope there's a lot of ideas being being fermented out there uh, let's uh, go ahead and move on to the last item on our agenda with the time remaining. Uh, and if you could bring that up, uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the legislative part since our last meeting when we looked at it and it didn't really seem like there was anything obvious, uh, you know, at first blush. But I think there may be some things legislatively that may may be, be things that could uh, could benefit. So here's, here's a, I think I emailed folks a, a copy of this, and, and so hopefully you'll be able to read it more at your leisure. But uh, it really, you know, when we were established, the RTD Accountability Committee, one of our, our biggest missions was a determination of long-range financial stability of the agency and how the agency can achieve stability and growth while meeting its core mission. And then COVID-19 really started hitting hard. And by the time we were going, I mean, we were already in a position where we had dramatically reduced services, where we had a, a huge decline in ridership. And uh, we had like a third of the ridership in our light rail, our $6 billion rail network, light and, and passenger. So uh, 
so I, you know, I said, what are the things that prevent us from really doing things that are potentially out of the box in terms of how we address this? Because I don't think there are any sort of conventional solutions at all that I see to, to what we're faced with. Recovery of ridership, you know, given all the challenges that are related to that, it's just not going to happen overnight. Uh, I think if we can get a grip on COVID sooner, then we have the potential to move that that schedule up considerably. But even if by the middle of next year we we really got enough people immunized that we we have uh, we aren't we aren't bound by that so much, we're we're still going to have some tough tough hills to climb. And so anyway. Uh, I looked at this fare box recovery ratio plans, and I, I really think being able to do anything out of the box is going to be restricted quite a bit uh, by that uh, Article 32, Section 9, 119.7 paragraph and, and the, the parts that are contained in that. And I really think that we would benefit a lot in terms of being able to do some of the things that are out of the box. If, if we can get the legislature to just strike that paragraph in its entirety and let us have the flexibility to try some different ideas in terms of rebuilding ridership. One of the things I think I mentioned before is the idea that when we vaccinate people, we give them a one month transit pass, at least the ones that are within the within the district, which is which is actually half of the entire state's population. And so, if there, we, we also have this problem of luring back all of those people who, many of whom are now working at home and may continue to work at home. And then the problem of all the people that have lost jobs. And those people that have lost jobs really especially need some help because the jobs they find are probably going to re require transportation and they may not be in a position where they have vehicles or alternative transportation. They will be. Many of them will be transit dependent, part of the transit de de dependent populations. There, there is something else though, and that is that if you look at uh, if you look at that section, it has quite a bit in there about who about reporting to the legislature, and also reporting to the Highway Legislation Review Committee of plans that RTD has, which is good. I mean, we we really need to coordinate with CDOT, but we also need to. Think about how we might simplify that that re reporting. And I know there are a lot of challenges related to dashboards and implementation of that. But that would seem like if if there's any way we can expedite that, that would seem like a way to address some of this reporting and also provide uh, more visibility into that. And all that stuff is in in this one paragraph that restrains us in the legislature. And so if we could eliminate that paragraph, I think we'd have a lot more flexibility. So I invite comments before we move on to this next next section, uh, the provision of retail commercial goods and services for district transfer facilities and residential and other use. Elise? Um, I totally agree. I had independently uh, wrote up my thoughts on uh, statutes yesterday and sent it to Ron and it was very um, heartening to realize that our thoughts um, pretty much coincide down down the whole list in terms of highlighting these three as the the top things that would provide more flexibility and opportunity for RTD. Um, and I think in particular of all of these, the fare back, well, parking and fare back box recovery are probably the most likely to to be impactful. Um, recognizing that there's not really they're not silver bullets, but they're part of a, a sort of a menu of things that we could do to facilitate RTD's sort of recovery and options for the future. Well, my concern is we're really restricted in doing very much other than pretty minor tweaks, unless we have some relief from some of this existing legislation. Agreed, agreed. Anyone else? Yeah, this is, this is Lynn. Um, uh, you know, I agree with the, you know, on the fair box uh, on all of these on the fair box recovery, and I'll just say again, um, 
that, you know, I'm not speaking for the agency at this point, but I noticed that you end this by saying we need to go back to staff and the board. And we have started that internal conversation about all of this. It just hasn't um, been fully vetted yet. But I think um, it's fair to say that that a general sense among the staff and, and uh, the board, hopefully, I think, is, is that um, with the fare box recovery ratio, in addition to limiting the board's ability to, you know, potentially lower fares in the way that you were talking about. Um, it's just not a meaningful measure. It's it, it, They talk about fare box, but they include grants and uh, other things. So for instance, our fare box recovery ratio this time would include the, the uh, $232 million in CARES Act recovery. So it's um, the, the measure that was put into the statute is not one that's used in the transit. It's, it's not very meaningful. Um, yeah, and I don't think they planned on that $232 million when they wrote this legislation 50 years uh, ago. No, and I, and I don't mean to, to say that that was even an outlier. It's just if you add in the grants and the other things that are put into that fare box recovery, it really makes it um, not a meaningful measure. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, I would agree with uh, your conclusion on that one. And just, I guess, speaking to the other ones that you're about to speak to, I think um you know again we'll come back with with views of the agency but uh you know the, in my opinion the more flexibility uh the board is given for instance on parking um to manage its different parking areas to move people to to different areas if needed or potentially to work with our local governments you know we might want different rules in in uh, one part of the district working with a, a local government than in another or uh, to be able to go fares and raise parking out, you know, I'm just hypothetical, but those are all reasons to look at that one. Um, yeah, and I guess I'll, hypothetical. And, and just to finish my comments, um, you know, I, I don't have a problem at all with the TOD uh, suggestions you make. I'm not sure um, how much those, none of these will have a huge effect. Um, uh, so I guess, but they all offer some flexibility and, and make some sense. Uh, staff, I, I think, feels less like the TOD provision need to be changed, but um, I don't know that they would have any concerns about this. And then there are a couple of other pieces that I think would be good for the committee to look at. One is the 58% maximum. Contracting. You know, there may be situations where uh, it's it, well. It should just be, I think, left to the agency to decide what's the least, what's the most cost-effective way to provide the services. Um, I don't know that the 58% has been a problem at all, but uh, again, it's, it's business effectively. We may have a more friendly legislature to to uh, address that issue with as well. I think, Lynn. Yeah. But uh, the the next. The, well, first thing we need to do is I need to share this with our other subcommittees and get their feedback on it as well. But uh, I, they're going to have their additions, the other subcommittees I'm sure will, and uh, hopefully uh, we can work together with RTD to, to have a united front on what we hope to change. Yeah, Rod, that was going to be my question on the, the process. So today you'd like to get the blessing from this subcommittee to then take this to the others and then it's not, I, I assume this would be a conversation for the full committee. It sounds like Elise had already started on that. Fortunately, yes. <laughs> I like the way she does that. She just goes for it. <laughs> oh. I do think, I think we can check in with the other subcommittees, but um, with the exception of the provision that um, Lynn just mentioned that's not on your list that was on mine about the 58 percent I think uh, multiple uh, minds are sort of converging on the same set of provisions that we should focus on so I imagine that um, if we can get get our collective pieces um, it, it, it put them into one piece and send it out to the to um, the full group we can have a a robust and hopefully definitive conversation at the next full committee meeting. Great. I, and I have no sense of ownership. This is not my, you know, I may have written this, but it's it's for all of us. And merging these with other other products and creating something that's 
got everything in it would I think be a, a worthwhile endeavor. Uh, on the on this second one here, the commercial goods and services, there's one particular part of that I, I wanted to mention, and that is uh, I, in some other work that I've done in, in research on books, the one thing that really struck struck me was the cost of parking spaces. The fact that if you parking spaces, they'll keep driving. But we've talked about the idea of develop, developing uh, residential facilities, for example, for people who uh, uh, are, are comfortable with the idea of using transit as their main source of, uh, of mobility. But there are uh, typically in, in uh, regulations and, and uh, there are restrictions on the number of parking places and code requirements of a lot of local areas. And if RTD has to go fight that with every one of those local areas, if they're going to try to build something like this, it, it would be uh, friction at best. Uh, in addition to the transit friendly uh, or transit friendly residences for most folks, there's also the potential to build transit friendly residences for people with, with serious disabilities. And so you could create uh, you could create great living situations with, with good access uh, to, to mobility through uh, RTD uh, for people that uh, otherwise, otherwise have a really hard time getting around. And so I, I think that's an additional worthwhile consideration in all of this. And, and uh, we need to work, consider working with those communities if we can move forward with any of it. Um, I certainly know some people that have done a lot of work in the area of development for uh, for low-income housing and things like that. But uh, that's a that's an important. Uh, those are often transit-dependent people, and they're people that we need to figure out how to provide services for. And then the last one is is the parking fees. I have no idea why the legislature feels like they have to control all the parking rate rules and regs. I mean, I, that may be something from a compromise in the legislature to get the original uh, facilities through. I don't know what the history of that is, but I think it's a bad idea. RTD can manage that. Uh, they don't need to be micromanaged by the legislature on it, and they need the freedom to be able to decide how to maximize the value of those very significant resources that they've invested in. Uh, and that is the 70 or so parking park and ride lots around through the district, which I hope we might be able to use for vaccination sites as well. So I open open this whole thing for comments from the other board members or first and then and then other people that are on the line. Committee members, not board members, sorry. Any other thoughts? Hey, Brett, could uh, for my own uh, education and others, the 58% uh, figure, I had a question uh, about that, if Lynn or Elise would like to expand a little bit more exactly what that is. Oh, okay. Please. Go ahead, Elise. Uh, just that, that that is now in statute as that RTD can contract with outside um, private operators for up to 58% of its transportation services. And then it outlines some provisions around uh, workforce and, and um, labor issues that um, will, uh, that they have to operate in. And I, is my understanding of the history of that, and feel free to, for any Lynn or Ron to jump in and correct me, it started as a much smaller percentage, like 28%. And um, that was um, a minimum, and now the 58% might be viewed more as a maximum. It's not clear that it is constraining RTD's current operations, um, but it also seems like an unnecessary provision to have in there, ideally, assuming operators have good um, uh, workforce and safety metrics. RTD's decisions on who provides services should be driven by cost effectiveness and things like that. And uh, they 
wouldn't be as constrained. Um, that I think is the provision that that probably needs a little bit more scrutiny and discussions with RTD to really understand if we're missing anything, if it would be unduly controversial to get rid of that. But um, again, it seems like an unnecessary micromanagement of RTD. What would you add to that, Lynn? You know, I think that was, you covered it very well, Elise. Um, you know, this one is one that um, I think does need a little more conversation within the agency. Um, and, uh, you know, we'll be bringing that back. But uh, I think that, you know, as you said, it started as a minimum, became a maximum. Uh, it's just another area where the flexibility, where the, uh, the board and the staff hopefully would have the flexibility to make the best business decisions. Thank you for letting uh, them add to the content on that, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that, and I think it's very helpful. Good. Yeah, I, I, uh, I might have had that one on my list if I hadn't run out of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I finished this about five minutes before our meeting started. So, need you know, just, um... I was up very late last night for some reason. <laughs> Red, I was just looking back at the, the guidance sort of framing document um, that Elise and Crystal had shared with the full, full committee in our October meeting, and there were four areas um, to look at for legislation, and, and with the contract um, issue that Elise brought up, this covers all four in there as well. Great. Good. Hopefully, it will be useful to, to share with the other committees after. Elise, feel free to take this over. Add the 58 percent um, and share it with the other committees and edit mine however you want to yeah well I, I like I said I was it, it was great to see that you and I were uh, of like minds and I think we just add in the 58 percent one as a possibility see if we can get some quick feedback from RTD and some of the other committee members that wanted to weigh in and then I think we can send it out in time for the the full committee meeting. Does that seem right, Ron? That uh, that makes sense to me. Great. There may be a couple of other very small statutes um, that are worth looking at, but uh, I'd say let's pursue that. We'll take it back to the staff and and uh, get back to you quickly on that. Okay. And at least you'll share you'll share with Lynn what we have and and with Troy. But what yep. you have after you've edited it and are happy with it. Yep. Right. Sounds good. Good. Let's try to move this thing right along. I, I did talk to Jeff last night for some reason, and he said that it is possible to get late late bill approval, but you have to basically get the either the Speaker of the House or the majority uh, leader or the President of the Senate the majority leader to approve late late bill legislation. Uh, I think a lot of a lot of people's agendas are for their bills are being prepared now, but there's there are other alternatives to get things in. And since they appointed us to solve all these problems, I would think they would be supportive. I hope. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think so. Good. Well, I think that's uh, before before we close. Well, we're no, we're five minutes late. Let's uh, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Uh, motion to adjourn. Let's adjourn. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you.